of nature and restoration. This is an offering of the Constellation Project, which Sam Myers will speak of in just a moment. And on behalf of the Center for the Study of World Religions and the Harvard Divinity School, um, we're so happy that you're here. It means the world to all of us. I must say it's a good night for the community. Um, the Red Sox won, and Jackie Bradley Jr. was the hitting star, as my father reminded me that um, there are many different kinds of constellations, and baseball is one of those. <laughs> Thank you, Dan, for being one of the permanent co-sponsors of uh, the Constellation Project. Dan Tragg is the director of the Harvard Center of the Environment. Charlie Stang is director of the Center for the Study of World Religions. He's not able to be with us tonight. And I also want to acknowledge Dean David Hempton of the Harvard Divinity School. Um, whose leadership inspires all of us. And Luann, welcome. Thank you for being here. Luann Hempton and Janet Gyotso, uh, who is the Associate Dean of Faculty and Academic Affairs. It means so much that your presence is here. And to Sam Myers, who's Director of the Planetary Health Alliance, who is the co-creator of, of the Constellation Project. And I want to acknowledge this amazing team that has put this together. Amalia Amada, Erica Vedas, and Perry Scheinbaum. Um, thank you for the beautiful flowers, for all of the details, and for being part of, of this community. I'm grateful for your attention to detailed good judgment and grace. I'm so nervous, so please bear with me. I realize I'm just going to slow down. I'm so excited about tonight. It's my pleasure to introduce Sam Myers. Um, to you tonight to speak on the importance of, of planetary health and why we've initiated the Constellation Project as a way to create deeper conversations across the disciplines where scientists, theologians, humanists, artists, educators, those in the business sector, and those in public service can come together and create a sense of wholeness in this fractured world. Sam, I want you to know what a a gift it is to work with you, and how much I appreciate the rigor of your mind and the vitality of your spirit. Um, I am growing. And I want to acknowledge um, Sam's family, Kelsey Worth, and beautiful Sophie and Lucy. Um, this is a community fair, it's a family affair, and I think that's what those of us at the Divinity School appreciate most, is what we have to glean and learn from one another. Um, Sam is not only the director of the Planetary Health Alliance, he's the principal research scientist at the Harvard T.H. Klan, Chan School of Public Health here at Harvard, and he's author of more than 50 peer-reviewed research articles and is currently co-authoring a book on planetary health with Howard Frumkin. Um, Sam's going to speak and then I'll introduce our storytellers. Sam, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Um, it's also been an unbelievable privilege for me to get to work with you for this past year. So if you're growing at all, I'm growing a lot more. Um, and thank you all for um, being here. It's really, really wonderful to see you. One always wonders when one schedules an event like this whether there'll be you know, two people and it will be a little bit awkward. So thank you for coming out tonight. There's so many things to do around here and for um, joining us and sharing your attention with us. Um, so as Terry said, I'm Sam Myers. Um, I direct the Planetary Health Alliance and I wanna try to keep my uh, remarks short and leave the stage for um, voices that are far more eloquent than um, my own, but I did want to share uh, just a few words with you about the origins of um, this constellation project. So maybe the early, easiest um, place to start is with a question. Um, how does a medical doctor end up uh, in collaboration with the Divinity School, and what does the idea of nature as a taproot of spirituality have to do with it. So 
I've spent my career focused on trying to understand uh, the human health impacts of our disruptions of our planet's natural systems and become convinced that um, those broad disruptions are going to actually drive the majority of the global burden of disease over this next uh, century. There's no doubt, as most of you all know, that we are now in the midst of an environmental crisis, that uh, nature is under siege. My own work focuses on um, how our emissions of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere uh, reduce the nutritional quality of the food we eat, how global declines of bees and other pollinators will drive increased disability and death from heart disease and strokes and certain cancers, how ongoing degradation of global fisheries puts the nutritional sufficiency of roughly a billion people into jeopardy. Uh, that work is part of a much broader emerging field of planetary health. And the premise of uh, planetary health is that our environmental crisis is now driving an urgent global health crisis. But the more that I've thought about these issues over the past couple of years, the more I've started to wonder whether beneath the environmental science and the public health epidemiology, there aren't a deeper set of questions. Um, how have we come to this? How, to be, how did it become okay to treat our atmosphere and our oceans as gigantic garbage dumps? To cut down half the world's forests and drive its non-human inhabitants extinct a thousand times faster than normal? What stories do we tell ourselves about our place in the world that make these actions okay? Is it possible that beneath the environmental crisis and the public health crisis that I've been talking about, there's also a spiritual crisis? So Edgar Mitchell, who was an American astronaut and the sixth person to walk on the surface of the moon, described what it was like to be on the moon and see Earth rise up above the moon's surface. Quote, suddenly, from behind the rim of the moon in long, slow motion moments of immense majesty, there emerges a sparkling blue and white jewel, a light, delicate sky blue sphere laced with slowly swirling veils of white, rising gradually like a small pearl in a thick sea of black mystery. It takes more than a moment to fully realize this is Earth, home, unquote. Many scientists invoke such reverential language in describing the almost unimaginable beauty and complexity and elegance of the objects of their study. And most of us experience something like awe or reverence in particular natural settings. But how has this reverence lost its authority to guide our decisions? Are there other traditions, other stories, that can help us heal a broken relationship to nature? These kinds of questions have been fodder for many a conversation over the past year with Terry. And together we've conceptualized a forum that we're calling the Constellation Project to explore with all of you. We hope to draw on many voices and many traditions to explore the idea of nature as a spiritual taproot. We certainly don't have the answers, not even all the questions, but we couldn't be more delighted to have you with us for these first baby steps along the way. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. The storytellers. Each of these extraordinary individuals have not only touched lives, but changed them with their power, intelligence, and wisdom. Call them 
pragmatic visionaries whose feet are firmly planted on the earth. They live with awe, wonder, and ferocity. They are both teachers and practitioners of the restorative art of the wild. Stacy Bear is a force of nature and a true leader through his open heart, greatness of spirit, and strength. I can tell you in the American West where we both live, he is respected and beloved. He is the founder of Adventure Not War and co-founder of the Great Outdoors Lab. Stacy is a father, husband, writer, skier, whitewater rafter and climber who found time outdoors to be his healing grace two years after coming home from the Iraq War. He and his team were the first ever to ski Mount Halgird in Iraq and in partnership with the great climber, free climber, Alex Honnold, his first ascents of various rock climbing routes in Angola. He was a 2014 National Geographic Adventurer of the Year and he is at home with his wife and daughter and cat in Sandy, Utah. Welcome, Stacy. Thank you. Pratima Munayapa is always seeking the pattern that connects with grace, integrity, and stunning acts of imagination. I see the world differently because of you. She's a researcher and elements fellow at the MIT Media Lab, working with the space-enabled group whose mission is to address issues of social justice in Earth's complex systems through technologies discovered in space. She's a recent graduate from the Graduate School of Design here at Harvard under a Fulbright scholarship, and she's a been a consultant to UNESCO, the World Bank, and the Government of India. In her words, in investigating traditional indigenous knowledge, her design research on sacred groves and alternative forest practices assumes complete synergy between the constructed categories of nature and culture, culture identity seen as ecological manifestation. Andrew Nalani is wise beyond his years and one of the most beautiful listeners I know. As a former student of mine at Dartmouth College, he is curious this is what I found of Andrew, that he's curious, porous, and perceptive. I believe he is a transformative figure of his generation. Andrew's passionate about providing youth access to emancipatory education opportunities. <laughs> Reoccurring themes in his work in education, both in East Africa and North America, include community, empowerment, art-based practices, and voice. He's been involved with Partners for Youth Empowerment since 2012, hosted at Whidbey Island, Whidbey Institute in Washington. And he also co-founded the African Youth Leadership Experience Camp for Youth from Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, and Tanzania. He completed a Master of Education in Human Development and Psychology here at Harvard, and is currently the Steinhardt Doctoral Fellow in Applied Psychology at NYU. All three of our storytellers are fearless and compassionate at once. I believe each one of them are driven by love of people and place, people in place with bows toward restoration, not without the vitality of the struggle. They are taking a stand on earth, each in their own way, each in their own time, with the gifts that are theirs that they will share tonight. May we hear them now. Each will speak for 20 minutes and then we'll come together as a community in conversation with your questions. Bless you for being here. Stacy. I don't know how to follow that. Uh, I think I have some slides, uh, and I'm not sure how to advance them forward. Oh, you want me to speak up there? The world never fits me, <laughs> which is pretty fantastic. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Terry. Um, Terry is uh, one of the three authors that helped to bring my wife and I together, alongside um, Wendell Berry and um, Wallace Stegner. 
So when Terry calls to say, do you want to come speak? You just say yes. Uh, is this, does it just go down? Can you see ours? Yeah, right. sorry. Ah, there we go. I'm also very technically deficient. I came from a career in the military where most of what I did was kick down doors. They never gave me any of the fancy equipment. I would always break it. Thank you. My name is Stacy Bear. If you work for a uh, company that has IT security, don't Google me. My last name is Serbo Croat for puddles, but it's English for naked. Which is funny, my mom made me figure skate, so people always thought that that was cool. All right, here we are. I'll stop with the stand-up routine and just stay leaned over and look awkward throughout this whole experience. Because I think we're recording it, so I need to speak in here. So um, this is my family in 19, about 1981. We were living in Botswana. I love this photo for a variety of reasons. I think these were in many ways the last truly happy years of my mother and father. They loved Africa. And um, I also love this because we're standing in front of a giant termite mound. And one of the cool things about termites is if you, if you go see this, everybody wants to stand next to it. You can see how big it is. My dad's about my height and my mom's about six foot. She always said she was 5'12". So you can see how tall these are. And we look at it as this great experience of nature. And yet sometimes we have a hesitancy to understand our own cities as nothing more than giant termite mounds. And to me, that's a very freeing feeling because it's a reminder that we actually are part of nature. So I was born in Nebraska. My mom's family are all Czech. My father's from West Virginia, which is why I'm so tall, because I'm, I'm not going to make the inbred joke. Never mind. Um, <laughs> But, and, and his family had been in West Virginia for about 12 generations. And so being born in Nebraska and moved to Africa at a really young age, one of the things that I think happens is, is that we root in to the places where we have our first memories. And so that place for me was in Botswana. Now I'm not of Botswana. I don't have long family ties there, but this is where my memories were rooted. And it was about the age of four that we moved to this place. And this is a split of South Dakota. And you can see the Badlands, our West River, uh, with the Black Hills and this very incredibly spiritual place. And you can see the prairie where I just came from actually this morning, which is the rolling prairie of eastern South Dakota. Both places are incredibly beautiful and incredibly wild. One, however, we think of when we think of South Dakota or wild places. But as uh, Willa Cather wrote, anybody can love the mountains. It takes a soul to love the prairie. And truly, I think, I am from the prairie, even though I live in Utah now. And it was great to be back home and to be scoured clean by the cold fall winter air, to also eat far too much walleye and cheese curds and fried food and tater tot casserole. But the hard thing about the prairie and flat places is that rather than seeing them as an opportunity for, wild for wilderness and the expression of the human spirit, far too often in humanity, we've seen them as an opportunity for crops. And so the prairie has been destroyed and ripped apart. And one of the things that I think is really important though, and we can talk a lot about colonialism of land, but one of the real challenges that I think we have in these spaces is as we revert back to wilderness, as we push back to these wild places, what do we do with the people that used to have an economic dependency and a love, even a love-hate relationship with the agriculture or the craft that they participated in over the years? And I think that's one of the challenges, and we witness, or we're witnessing that in Terry and I's home state of Utah now, in southeastern Utah, where so many people were so frightened of a wilderness designation around bear's ears. And sometimes I wonder, and have had conversations, were they frightened because it was going to lead to increased visitation? Were they frightened because it meant that they couldn't have jobs any longer, jobs in the oil and gas industry, or, and especially when I look at mining, right? Coal mining even if we bring back coal mining, like West Virginia is still gonna be in the lower 5% when it comes to GDP, right? It's always been a rough, difficult, we've treated it as a third world bastardized cousin of the rest of America. So will coal mining bring it back? Well, maybe not, but one of the things that I always found interesting in coal mining 
in a lot of the extractive industries is there's community there. There's community in that suffering. There's community in going through something together and we value hard work, right? And, and I think that's always a weird thing because there's a lot of really horrible people out there who've done horrible things that are incredibly hard workers, right? You can't take away from their work ethic. So we've got to figure out how we value work ethic and what they do. And in a place like Moab, which has been replaced, we've, we've gone away from uranium mining, and now people are selling t-shirts. And is there dignity in that? And when we think about the outdoor industry and we think about that, are we just as extractive as that mining evidence? Because we've gone to it. The outdoor industry is a multi-billion dollar affair, right? But that multi-billion dollar affair isn't in Blanding or Bluff, Utah. And so as happy as I was to see brands like Patagonia come out strong in support of public lands, I was pretty frustrated that Patagonia demanded that they kept all their economics and all their manufacturing and their corporate headquarters in Ventura, California. Because if you believe so much that you're willing to invest millions of dollars of advertising campaigns, then come to bluff, right? And come to know these types of things in these places. So I grew up in South Dakota. I joined the military. I left the military. I thought I had a picture in here. I, I was a drum major of my high school. I thought that picture made it in here, but it didn't. Um, I left the military in 2004. I did landmine clearance. This is me with my very first landmine. Landmine clearance, by the way, is a very boring job until it isn't. I went from Angola to the former Soviet state of Georgia. This is Abkhazia. On the other side of these mountains is Sochi, which you may remember from the Winter Olympics. This is an incredibly beautiful place. What's really fascinating about the Caucasus and, and spending time in the Caucasus mountain region is it made me think a lot when I was there about the way we think of tribe, right? And in America, we typically divide ourselves up into native and non-native, right? That's one way we can split ourselves up. But when I was in the Caucasus, it came to me because people looked like me. They were relatively white. The Caucasus are one of the few places where I can blend in with the general population, the other one being you know, Norway. Um, but what it came to me there, it was a reminder that we all used to be indigenous that we all used to be native to somewhere. And one of the things that I think is happening that's so violent to all of us is that there are multiple layers between our feet, our souls, and our rituals now in the land and the environment, especially for European Americans and African Americans who are wrenched from their soil through slavery. We don't know where we are from unless you have deep cultural roots. Even my dad, who's been in West Virginia seven years, or for seven generations, and just recently returned, or 12 generations, does not know the name of the stream. He calls it Turkey Creek. I know that that's not the name of that stream, if it even had a name. And sometimes I think we put too much emphasis on place names and too much emphasis on these locations, right? I mean. Canada is the Iroquois word for village, right? And so somebody showed up and was like, where are we? And you can imagine the Iroquois looking around and going, uh, Canada? <laughs> it's a village, right? And I mean, and now we call the whole country that. And it's the same thing I was saying earlier. Did you know that the Dakota are the smallest of the three large federations of the Sioux tribe? But because they were at that intersection where Sioux City now stands, a lot of your sausage and bacon comes from Sioux City, by the way, um, they were the Dakota. So all of a sudden, we have the Dakota Territory. And if you're in Dakota or Lakota, you got to be pissed off, right? Because it's like, you guys screwed over our land. You gave us these blankets full of smallpox. And now, now we're the forced to live in the Dakotas. We're the Dakota. We're the Lakota people. So we've even screwed up how we do our naming. But I think because of that, we're broken, right? We're cut off. So where do we go from sustenance? And in the military, one of the things I learned is you got to keep your supply train, right? The only way to make a war work is to be attached to your supply train. But that's with everything. And I think we're cut off from that spiritual sustenance. So right before in Abkhazia, I got recalled to the United States military to serve in Iraq. And right before I went, I got to spend about 10 days in Bujigali Falls in Uganda. Um, I actually had no idea um, where you were from when I started this, but this was a beautiful place. And even then, when I was there, people were mourning the coming passing of Bujigali Falls because of a hydroelectric power plant that was coming to take over there. 
And it's another place where we're again, we're cut off. And what does that mean for the people of Uganda? What does that mean for the people of the world who could have gone and seen the power of this very, very special place? And even there, in a nominally Christian country, many people spoke to me about the spirits of the forest and the spirits of the water. And where do those spirits go? When they can't play. And I think Bujigali Falls might have been the place where I learned most the power of joy and the power of play. Because from there, I went to war. This is me in Baghdad. Um, I weighed about 300 pounds when I was in Baghdad. I wasn't a very heavy guy. That's what I dressed in most days. I had a Kevlar helmet as well. I carried a small uh, automatic rifle that in my hands looked like a small pistol. I had smoke grenades. Oftentimes I carried the large um, squad automatic weapon. Even though I was the team leader, I was the biggest person there. And I was typically the first person to kick down a door if that was necessary. And my job there was to win the hearts and minds of the Iraqi people. We were there to help. I walked into an orphanage one day, knocked on the door, and a woman in perfect English said to me, oh, are you here to check out the weapons of mass destruction in my basement? So I just smiled and said, yes. So I got back from Iraq. I moved to Philadelphia. I used to joke the reason I moved to Philadelphia is because I wanted an easy transition from a war zone to back home. I was talking about Eagles games, not the socioeconomic status of the city. I got home. I went to South Africa first, surfing for a few days, about three weeks. Went to Israel, Lebanon, went to, back to Europe. And one of the things that struck me when I was there was that I missed the adrenaline of war. So I started a cocaine habit. And I tell you, and I got into the University of Pennsylvania. I couldn't get into Harvard. But one of the great things about the Ivy League schools, right, is how easy it is to get a student loan once you're there. And Citibank does not care what you pay for that. And so for my two years in Philadelphia, I think I could have gotten a small economic development award for a village in Bolivia for the amount of cocaine that I went up my nose. And I was really just trying to replicate the stoke and, and this weird, frustrated, corrupted awe that happens in war. And I wanted to kill myself when I got home. And I wanted to kill myself when ultimately I moved out to Colorado. And my buddy Chuck said to me, put off suicide for a couple of weeks and come on out rock climbing. And I thought, I mean, at the end of the day, if I'm going to commit suicide, I can wait now or I can wait in two weeks. And I don't mean to necessarily joke about suicide, but for me, humor is one of the only ways that I can get through this. And I've lost a lot of friends, and I know probably many people here have lost a lot of friends to suicide and death. And it's one of the things, if, if nothing else out of this conversation that you take away, please just call it death by suicide. Because I've begun to see suicide as a disease, and I've begun to see much of what we can do around suicide as hospice care. And I don't want to ever say that anybody was weak in their suicide. In the same way that we would never say after somebody passed cancer, they didn't fight hard enough or they didn't try hard enough, that's bullshit. We're all going to go out of this world at some point. And sometimes people die by suicide, and sometimes it's a car accident or cancer or war. And sometimes war never leaves you. And one of the things I learned when I was spending time outside because at first when I came home, I was really angry. And I didn't think anybody else could understand my anger unless they too had served in a war zone. And over time, what I realized through the outdoors, because in the outdoors, right, it doesn't matter if it rains. It doesn't matter if it's hot outside and what your socioeconomic preferences or religion or sexual or gender are. That's the wonderful thing about nature, right? And that's, I think, the fear that so many cities and leaders have with us is they don't want us to experience this place where really equality and liberty and justice happen. So it's easier to keep us all inside. But I began to realize that other people who had never been to war were warriors. And I began to realize that other people who had never seen what I had seen had trauma. And one of the things with that, too, is that I want to really talk about here briefly is that I am your veteran in this country. I'm yours. I signed up nominally on your behalf. And when I come home, whether or not you agree with the war or not, I'm still yours. I'm your tax burden. And so if you want to thank a veteran in a way that moves us beyond war, use our public lands. Fight for our public lands. And I realize that can be a unique concept here in New England. But you have plenty of public lands. Get out and use them for your own health. 
And if nothing else, the next time you go, be like, you know what? This one's for Stacy. So I started climbing, met lots of kids, learned about generalized versus acute trauma. Nature helps with both. Wanted to put some scientific data behind it, which is kind of horse crap, because we know from all our spiritual traditions, right, that nature's pretty cool. That's how we can access the divine. Buddha's sitting under a tree. Jesus does the Sermon on the Mount. Moses goes to the top of the mountain. One of the cool things about all those stories, too, is there's always a little bit of suffering, right? It's not like Moses took like an easy walk up that mountain. He had to really work it after 40 years out in the, you know, out in the wild. After that, I made the decision that it was time to start going back to these places, that I could come up with some level of engagement to help rewrite or add to my narrative, not change my narrative, because I think it's important to remember pain and hurt. And I think it's okay to be hurt and painful. And I think it's okay to remember that even if the rest of you and the rest of the world is going through really hard times, it doesn't mean that you don't give a shit if you're having fun yourself. Just don't always have fun, right? Put some effort into it. You can be an optimist, and still be mad as hell, and still be frustrated, and still be afraid, and still be an optimist. So Alex Honnold and I went back to Angola. Moments before this picture was taken, I tried to do the whole Lion King thing with him. It was about one of four times I nearly killed Alex, but I'm not allowed to use that photo. Then I came home from Angola, and we were lucky enough that my wife and I had this little person join us in the world. This is my daughter, Wilder. And uh, this is one of the reasons where I am incredibly optimistic about the future. Because there couldn't be this much sheer joy in the world if there wasn't a chance. And after that, because of the encouragement of my amazing partner, she said, it's time for you to go back to Iraq. So I found a couple buddies, and this is us skiing in Iraq. And that's me with a mustache doing my best impressionation of highway patrolman. That's my buddy Griff in the middle and our friend Robin on the right. Um, Iraq is this incredible, incredible place. This is Kurdistan, but it's still technically within the international boundaries of Iraq. And one of the reasons we went there was because we wanted people to see more to this country and more to the narrative than is normally seen in typical disaster and war reporting. I actually have no idea where I'm at with time. Ooh, four more minutes, all right. So one of the things, I have a mild traumatic brain injury that impacts my executive functioning. I typically start a conversation with, with that, but I don't do it. If we're climbing together, I'll wait until you're just about ready to start climbing, and then I'll remind you of that. Um, but I think, you know, when we think about how this communicates and connects to all these things, the other thing that I think is really important to remember, the spirituality of it all, and I've said this to a few folks today, regardless of your religious beliefs, or lack thereof, or your beliefs in science, one of the things that seems to be most agreed upon is that we are made out of mud. We came from the mud, we were formed out of the mud, and at some level that mud came from on high. It came from a voice of God, which if you ever get to hear Yusuf Kumanyaka speak, he's an incredible poet. That's what God will sound like. I think James Earl Jones is more St. Peter. No offense. <laughs> and we know that that mud came from that celestial being or from stars. And at some level, that's what we all get to return to, is that same glorious mud, those same glorious stars. And in that is this kernel of beastliness, which is so good. So I encourage you all to find that beast and be that beast. And one of the things that Terry's husband, Brooke, who's also an incredible, incredible individual and I think has lived on this earth for thousands of years is the true incarnation of Puck. He wrote in a book called, um, what is it, Open Midnight? He talked about Cain and Abel. And for some reason in this country, and I bring this up because we're at a divinity school, God favored Abel because he wasn't civilizing. He wasn't cultivating. And yet, 6,000 years on, if you believe that time frame, Cain has been winning. And no wonder we're so sad and so angry and frustrated as a world. We weren't meant to cultivate. We were meant for joy. 
We were meant to play in the mud. And I encourage you all to find some time to do that. And there's all sorts of other things I could talk about, about the experience of awe and how this has real value to your health and the science behind that. But science doesn't seem to be moving the conversation right now. But I really think playing in the mud can. Thank you so much for having me out tonight. for that beautiful, beautiful talk. I'm exquisitely nervous to follow after that. Um, how do I? <coughs> sit? Oh, yeah. Thank you all for being here and for having me. Um, my name is Pratima Muniappa. I'm with the uh, MIT Media Lab. And I want to speak today about Sylvan Synesthesia. Um, the ethnosphere is woven into the matrix of the biosphere as a simultaneous duality, and yet modernity has served to disentangle nature from culture and form from the formless to birth of me material mechanistic nature. This stands in sharp contrast to indigenous cosmologies that define the ecological identity of the environments from within. Historically, and right down to present day, the state-sponsored rhetoric marginalizes indigenous forest-dwelling tribes in India and frames their habitation as detrimental to the environment. I hope to trace the historical vicissitudes of this colonial attitude and its subsequent transformation into the secular science of conservation. In investigating indigenous practices, my talk will weave through myth, memory, and metaphor to illustrate how rituals perform the terrain of forest practice. Um, it explores what design can do if it assumes complete synergy between the constructed categories of nature and culture. The Muslim weavers, a small indigenous community that dot the coastline of Bangladesh, offer an illuminating example. Dhaka muslin is a diaphanous cloth, uh, like the light vapors of dawn. It needs intense moisture and high humidity to weave. And as the, the mist descended, the weavers would equip their boats with looms and go out to seek the fog. A bamboo bow was used to strum across the fibers, and it caused the lightest fleece to separate into the air. And it was this rhythm that set the cadence to spin muslin out of air. Um, the mist gives birth to the weavers in the cloth and the tribes to the mist. So how does one conserve the craft without a simultaneous conservation of the material's ecology? Indian forests have never been natural. Their synthetic entity is shaped by the drumming of the fire to the beat of the monsoon. Its indigenous people were accustomed, accustomed to exploiting fire. Forests were set aflame to make way for agriculture, who subsequently abandoned fallow, converted organic residues into fertilizer, kept woodlands and prairies in grass, and cleansed soil of pathogens. Fire structured the intricate ensemble of biomes that were made by and in turn made possible human society. The arrival of the British inserted an enduring silence to the drumbeat of fire and water that danced across the land. It exposed the economy to cycles larger than the annual pulse of growth and decay and shot the encircling fire into the combustion chamber of steam engines. The inability of the British to understand fire's generative role led to a forest management that primarily centered on fire suppression through the principles of scientific forestry. By the 1600s, my oak had vanished in England and the colonial project turned its sights to Indian forests. After a century of extraction to feed the empire's growth, the government instituted a forest department to safeguard its economic interests. And thus it was under the tenets of scientific forestry that conservation was introduced to India. The landscape was carved up into working grids to enable maximum sustainable yield. Transformed into quantitative data, trees were classified, categorized, and plotted on a continuum of growth rates and loss rates. Rules producing artificial even age monocultures were hailed as hallmarks of scientific knowledge. The extractive economies of the forest department performed further vivisection to the land as individual trees were carved up for the exigencies of industry. In 1913, 
the forest department earned a profit equivalent to $13 billion today. And released from the cycle of fire and rain, Indian forests were conserved as steady state entities, a reliable progenitor of resource. Conservation then developed as a discipline of stasis, a method to manage the status quo. 1991, Durga, India. It was a summer day and the coxcomb blossoms had burst into iridescence. The fragrance of jasmine offered nuance with lemon scent. I was four years old. A leopard entered my field of vision and Iris met Iris. Close enough to be familiar and yet far apart not to dissolve into intimacy, the leopard kept me company that whole summer. It was my first introduction to beauty. One evening, my mother looks out of the kitchen window to see a leopard encircling her child. Her scream pierces the heavy summer air and rouses a ragtag mob into action. The gardeners, the kitchen boys, and the villagers, they storm into our backyard and corner my leopard into the garage. Three gunshots stir up the air. Something breaks in the world as I know it. All I hear is a flurry of sound, manic laughter, something being dragged, and then silence. Still, that magnificent dapple body is draped over a pushcart, one <coughs> paw dripping blood. A river is born, its torrent unabated even as they drag him into the horizon. My first introduction to the fragility of beauty. Glass eyes replace the spirit I'd encountered before. My taxiderm leopard adorns the living room. I avoid that room forever. My first introduction to conservation. Forest governmentality demanded a simultaneous subjectification of the governed. As landscapes were made legible for extraction, so too was the same courtesy extended to its constituents. Darwin's origin of species provided the heuristic key that race theory to that, to that point had been lacking. Among the most influential of these was Ernest Haeckel's thesis, which offered a scientifically grounded continuum upon which different races could be plotted for their stage of development in levels of civilization, political consciousness, and social organization, from ape to male European aristocrat. The people of India census recruited quasi-scientific um, ideas to support the criminalization of entire communities. It marked a period of transformation in the bureaucratic use of ethnographic data to substantiate native criminals. The measure was part of a wider attempt at social engineering in which the categorization of indigenous castes or tribes was a means of facilitating the curtailment of forest rights. Armed with calipers, census, and cadastral maps, the colonial gaze carved up the landscape, a mammoth task of state simplification that organized bodies into race, wrote criminality into the cranial landscape, and invented a body of teleological history to mute cultures orbiting a cyclical cosmology. Post-independence, Indian forestry was rechristened with a series of policy shifts, beginning with the nationalization of forests. Forestry for commerce, in competition with the paranoia for protectionism, were the prevailing patterns. This resulted in the constitution of large forest sanctuaries and a totalizing embargo on human ingress within the sanctuaries. Thus, the confluence of state-sponsored rhetoric, forest governmentality, the authority of science, the anti-humanism of conservation, extractive economies, and the tourist gaze frames the forest tribal as the primary threat to the environment. The real risks to Indian forests today are not of change, but of permanence, not of the inevitable reorganization mandated by acts of organismic extraction, but of the stubborn inertia of sovereign systems and frozen identities assigned to inherently open systems. The landscape of forest management is replete with dualities. Should the state manage the forest wilderness areas or should local communities? Should people be allowed to use protected areas or should these areas be inviolate? Should Western science or local knowledge position policy? Is protection a remedy or a problem? Perhaps the muted worlds of indigenous cosmology can help us dissolve these dualities. 
While policy describes the legal boundaries of permissible actions within a forest, notions of the sacred are very powerful animators of the practices that operate within policy. Sacred forests provide evidence of alternative forms of stewardship. They can largely be designed or defined as areas that are protected because they enshrine a spiritual or cultural significance. They are conserved by community consent. Extensive studies show that groves, these groves render ecosystem services like maintaining high species and habitat diversity, erosion control, and watershed management. They're important sites of biorefugia for threatened species and serve as genetic banks for forest recovery. But it's critical, though, to treat culture as the progenitor of these practices. The conservation service rendered by these groves is an unintended outcome of cultural practices. These groves are manifested not as ethnobotanical museums, but as ritual enactments. Indi indigenous knowledge is transmitted through the medium of song, story, dance, art, and ritual in a continuum where practice becomes into place. Communities that have clocked centuries of cultural adaptation in, in reciprocity with a dynamic ecology have done so in part through ritual representation of resource management. My objective here is not to extol the traditional as virtuous, but merely to ask what form a design practice might take if it considered ritual as an instigator of forest morphology. In the absence of policy, ritual remains the primary performance, the palpable site where ecological memory occurs and forest practice proliferates. The Solikas of the Bilikiri Rangala Hills are an indigenous tribe living in the Western Ghats of India. This representation draws heavily on my brilliant colleague Ria Shah's work, who's kind enough to be here today. With 27 words for rain, burnt suit rain, rain that kisses the leaf litter and doesn't wet the ground, the rain that makes elephants shiver, the coherence of the Soliga language is inseparable from the coherence of their surrounding ecology. Encoded as ecological memory, culture emerges from the expressive vitality of the terrain. For the Soliga, the sylvan universe is semiotically laden. The sight of a plant, the migration of the bees, the pregnant elephant are signs that communicate with them. The onset of the Mungaru Malay, or the leaf litter wetting rain, is enacted through its reciprocal ritual. The Dhulubhumi, or the Mother Earth Festival, is performed to propitiate the goddess to pray for a good harvest. The Tamadi, or the shaman, choreographs the rituals, entering into a trance to seek communion with the more than human earth. He emerges from the trance with the sacrifice of a hen, and then distributes seeds among the attendees to broadcast later into their fields. As the blood seeps into the thirsting earth, the legumes that are sown restore nitrogen back into the soil. The rain and ritual alike signal the harvesting of wild jackfruit and honey. Some of the soliga observe a specific diet as long as the legumes express the earth. The self-imposed sanction on consumption allowing keystone species to thrive. In the world of orality, there is no separation between language or the world. Ritual establishes an exact correspondence with commensurate entities. It gives us an entryway to think about how one might design a non-dual forest practice. Forests exhibit a pulsing paradigm. The constituents of its environment ebb and flow in evolving reproductions. Rituals can be designed by tuning taboo and sanction to control the rate of forest foraging and extend reprieve to keystone species during periods of biological regeneration. 2017, the highlands of Bhumtang, Bhutan. The night had drawn its dark tassels across the sky. We had just finished dinner and were ingesting the silence. Suddenly, a group of people just burst into the hut, seeking the shaman's aid to heal a terrible stomachache. As they described the symptoms that brought them here, the shaman agreed that it was indeed serious, and my interest was piqued. We'll need to take a two-pronged approach, she said. Why don't you take four members of your family, and you know that, eat, that little pond that lives, that is at the eastern pine train? It's full of algae, and it needs to be dredged. So as you guys go ahead and do that, I'll begin by offering prayers to the spirits. Um, 
And I thought that it was very interesting because a profound notion of interbeing is revealed when the shaman sees no distinction between an ailment of the flesh and an imbalance in the surrounding ecology in performing the connection between a eutrophying pond and a digestive system, he collapses the separatedness that begins its skin, between inside skin and outside skin. The shaman is a being of interstice, the mythology and ritual of which he is a manifestation, calls for his role as an intermediary, ensuring the appropriate flow of nourishment from the human community back to the local earth. Only by tuning to the animate presence of the environment can the shaman restore balance through ritualized gift exchanges with the more than human world. Forest regulation bodies restrict tribal access to forests, leaving them without any other form of economic activity for most of the year. Communities that subsist on forest food maximize their foraging in that narrow window and pursue and unsustainable harvesting. Having learned that it's crucial to link economics with indigenous agency, Aaron Mendonca and I have been working on developing a business that addresses the joint problem of forest degradation and indigenous poverty by supporting small forest enterprises with design. For example, this is Lantana Kamara, an invasive species of colonial provenance that has, whose incursions into the land has broken down centuries of ethnobotanical knowledge and compromised native biodiversity. A design intervention in identifying the plant as material for furniture incentivizes the community to clear lantana, thus generating new succession regimes for native plants. Responding to the critiques on fair trade, we created an online platform that documents the forest shaping rituals that convert into a product using blockchain tech. QR codes on the product leads consumers to a platform where they can see how their products were foraged and by who. It enables us to think of trade in terms of transformation and products as byproducts of culture. <laughs> Providing economic activity throughout the year affords communities the ability to flex their activities around forest palaces. In January, Aaron organized a studio for Henry Kelly from the AA to build ecotourism structures in the Ghats. The design draws inspiration from other architects on the site. This is a funnel spider's web. These shelters are built in collaboration with indigenous groups out of banana fiber and is studded with seeds from the forest stands. As the structure degenerates, it'll become the, it'll become the substrate for new succession regimes, thereby growing a new forest. Um, in the marshy wetlands of Forbjika Valley, the arrival of the black neck crane signals the onset of the planting season for the local villagers. The locals revere the crane, and yet economic hardship has led them to encroach upon the crane's breeding grounds to expand their agricultural fields. The crane is considered sacred in Bhutanese mythology, and this offered an entryway to intervene through design. The Bhutanese Nature Conservancy and indigenous leaders drew deep into the local tradition and invented the Black Neck Crane Festival. They invented new iterations of cuisine, drawing from old recipes, new cultural practices that render ecological services, new songs that capture the crane's behavior as cultural narrative. Tourism alleviates certain pressures on the land to perform as a productive resource. It offers a simultaneous incentive to reinvigorate cultural folkways. The taboo on encroaching into the crane's habitat is designed and enforced by culturally mediated consent, a social fencing, as it were, a design taboo. The last thing I hope to share with you tonight is a project I'm only just embarking on in my role as a researcher at MIT Space Enable Group. This project is a platform to crowdsource and geotag indigenous knowledge, songs, stories, rituals, relating to resource stewardship across the globe, and set it in conjunction with scientific studies that are emerging from the same geographies. The aim is to infer correlations or divergences between them in order to build a database where indigenous knowledge is regarded with the same validity as scientific knowledge. I hope that it can serve as a useful tool to address issues of authorship, intellectual property, and inform conservation policy. 
Um, I extend an open invitation to all of you to collaborate and help shape the direction of this nascent work. In conclusion, geophysical fluxes and commercial extraction have accelerated such rapid changes in, the forest, compos in forest composition that they're asynchronous with the pace of the rituals that I've, that I've described. This opens up a new avenue for us to design new rituals across scales and in response to the changing environment. In order to dissolve boundaries that perpetuate false binaries, design's task can be that of taking up the ritual with all of its potency and in consultation with its constituent people, performing the ritual back into the landscape. The craft is in unleashing a morphological enact enactment in the forest's own tongue finding sanction and taboo that creatively compose the migration of cranes across the earth, the emergence of algae in a eutrophying pond, planting performances like seeds under rocks and fallen logs, letting language take root again in the muted silences of a nature mechanized. Thank you. Thank you, Pratima. Thank you, Stacy. I left my hometown in Uganda in 2010 when I received a scholarship to complete my last years of high school at the United World College, UWC USA in New Mexico. I, I will say that there is uh, two United World College students, friends of mine who are in the agent, so shout out to you both. In the FAQ section of the school's website, I had read a student's comment that, and I quote, Nothing can prepare you for a UWC education. You only have to remain open. I thought to myself, ha, they do not know the God I serve. I scoffed at the idea of remaining unprepared because in the evangelical tradition in which my sisters had raised me after my mother had passed, I'd come to believe that there was no room for being unprepared. Those who found their strength in the Lord would go from strength to strength. When I arrived in New Mexico, the students a year above us were eager to receive us. They ran after the bus that brought me and about 40 other students to campus. And as soon as we pulled in front of the dining hall, they were drumming on the bus, singing, squinting in the dark to identify our faces, faces they had only briefly seen on Facebook or dormitory rosters, faces of their soon-to-be roommates. Those who could not see us clearly in the dark yelled out our names. The exuberance was palpable. My roommate, Juan Pablo from Guatemala, ran over to me and hugged me, called his friend Innocent from Tanzania, and together they, carried my, they helped carry my large suitcase to my dorm room. Surrounded by students from some 80 different countries, Students with whom I was now going to leave and study for the next two years, I quickly sensed that this was going to be unlike anything I'd experienced in my life before. Despite all the hugging, despite the, all the warm, welcoming knots our second years had pinned on our dorm room doors, despite all the excitement around me, I felt my stomach tighten. For the first time, I was going to leave and study with people who did not necessarily look or believe the same way as me. Although no one was pointing a finger at me, I felt threatened as an evangelical. Over the weeks that would follow, I made it a point to wear this dark t-shirt I'd carried with me from Uganda. 
It had a large print in green that said abstinence only on the front and quoted a scripture on the back, which I don't quite recall. My days were predictable. When I wasn't in class or the dining hall or at, a community, or at community service, I was in the sanctuary of my dorm room, consulting notes from my Bible journal or teachings from American-based televangelists that I'd recorded while I was in Uganda. I was trying to get a grip on my sensibilities around this new school environment. In the three months leading to my departure from Uganda, I'd spent a great deal of time in my bedroom studying the word of God and praying in tongues to prepare myself to be far away from home and to prevent any misfortune that would prevent the scholarship opportunity I just received from not manifesting. Having grown up in a family that struggles with finances, an opportunity for a fully funded education experience seemed too good to be true. And by necessity, the best I could do was to call on a higher power to secure the blessing in my lap, lest it mysteriously disappear. Now, miles away from Uganda, here I was, spreading out different cities on my bed, each with a different someone, a someone topic by a preacher, ruffling my fingers through two different Bible translations, trying my best to hold on to a vitality and meaning I'd once found in these guides that were now losing their glow. I was in uncharted territory. During orientation, the school's vice president had led a session with all first years to explore the school's values. After about 106 of us were gathered in the auditorium, he distributed small pieces of blank paper, one per person. On these, we were to write our answer to the question he just posed. What does sustainability mean to you? The activity went like this. After we wrote our answers, we were to fold the little pieces of paper that would remain anonymous, and then walk around the auditorium exchanging these little pieces of paper so that we wouldn't end up with our own paper in our hands. So by the time he called for volunteer, by the time he called pause and asked volunteers to read out what was written on the piece of paper that they found themselves holding, I found myself freezing a little bit. I'd frankly never heard of the word sustainability. So on my paper I wrote, sustainability means believing in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I don't remember if someone, had read, if someone read my answer out to the whole auditorium. If that was the case, here's two th things I think might have happened. I either summoned the ground to open up and swallow me alive, or I pretended to look around equally surprised like everyone else that one of us had actually written such an answer. In October, two months after I arrived in New Mexico, I met Malak at an interfaith dialogue workshop. Malak is from Palestine and a Muslim too. She wore a light blue hijab and spoke with a heavy Arab accent. The facilitator in this interfaith workshop asked all of us participants to use pipe cleaners to model a shape of our social identities and then share them with a partner. <laughs> Facilitators. <laughs> Blue, pink, red, purple, and green were the colors of the pipe cleaners we used. Malak and I exchanged our pipe cleaner identity models. I turned her model between, about between my fingers, a green circle in the middle to which all other strands of her identity had been woven. Mine had a cross in the center. It was red. As you observe your partner's model, Take one pipe cleaner, see what happens, and discuss with your partner, the facilitator said. I took out a green pipe cleaner, the circle that had held the rest of Malak's identity strands. During debrief, Malak said, Andrew, when you took that green pipe cleaner from my model, I felt like you'd ripped my life apart because you took my Islam away. I gasped. 
My way of believing is causing harm for her, I thought to myself. It was the first time in my life that I'd recognized what I'd be, that, that what I'd believed to be a noble mission, winning souls for Christ, was also a weapon that destroys. Another year would pass before I could fully register how this recognition would alter my own life's path. I was attending a short course youth leadership program in Canada with some 90 other 15 to 18 year olds from across the world. And um, Hillary has been to that program as well. A friend of mine I met there, Valerie, and I were hiking through a forest towards a lake. On a cliff overlooking the lake, I munched my turkey and cucumber sandwich while sharing with Valerie about Christ's love. When I paused, Valerie spoke, too bad for people like us who are never raised Christian. I guess there is nothing to do, but we are doomed for hell. The silence that followed pierced my heart. I glanced at her when she spoke. She dropped her head low. This is crazy, Andrew, I thought to myself. My heart churned from seeing Valerie so cast down as I wrestled to come to terms with the hopelessness I was feeling about my intentions of bringing someone to Christ. Somehow, I'd forgotten that grace becomes evident when the human will founders, especially when the hum human will founders. Why did I act in a way that condemned people who'd cared enough to listen to my stories, to accept me, to hold me, without boxing me into some category during this program? Valerie's remark haunted me all day I sought solace in a forest later that evening. I sat by a tree stump protruding shyly from beneath the ground, log debris and blades of grass greeting the long-awaited summer kept me company. All around me were gigantic Douglas firs whose leaves rustled with the wind. Sometimes I'd spot deer greeting me from afar with silent stare. This land was unceded territory of the Beecher Bay First Nation. Home to deer and black bear fast, this forest received me also to join its, symphon its wild symphony. The tree stump by which I sat was my spirit spot. Everyone in this short course program had a spirit spot, a place on the land where each of us would retreat in silence after dinner for an hour of reflection. During spirit spot sessions, we slowed the paces of our feet and left behind cell phones, music, or books with other people's words. The program coordinators, also facilitators, <laughs> instructed us to carry only our journals and pens. Use your senses, they'd say, and trust what comes. I shared my innermost secrets with my journal and my spirit spot. In my spirit spot, I felt I could be with myself without fear, of without fear of judgment or punishment. But that evening, Valerie's words haunted me. I remembered that phrase, I guess people like me who are raised without a religion are doomed for hell. Those words pierced my heart. Could it be true that all these people I'd come to love so much would perish helplessly for this one decree? Trembling, I scribbled in my journal God, I do not know whether you've created a heaven or a hell, but if you have, I reject your heaven, I'll go to hell and love people out of it. Here I was, a Christian, listening to the voice of the devil. I thought, blood rushed to my head, I felt it. I thought my brains would burst open for speaking blasphemy. It was though a carpet suspending me in air had been removed, taken from beneath my feet. I was falling, an endless fall with no ground for my body to land. This is what bewilderment feels like. And yet the forest held me. Douglas Farr was my witness. That moment in the forest stayed with me when I returned to the deserts of New Mexico after this program for my final year in high school. I visited the nearby Pentecostal church to which, I'd been to which I'd been several Sundays before I went to the youth program in Canada. In his closing prayer, 
The church pastor declared, let's preach the gospel of Christ to all the world. We must never rest. Let's bring into the body of Christ even those who worship Allah. My knee jerked. I thought of Malak. I remembered Valerie. I stood up, gathered my belongings, and walked out of the door and never looked back. I found solace in the forest on a hill where my school's water tank was located. The forest was the only place I felt I could belong to the questions that came up for me as my world was becoming less and less simple, not just in high school, but in college too. As a first generation black student at an elite college, I considered transferring out of Dartmouth six times in my first year alone or dropping out of the whole college project altogether. On one hand, I could quit this college thing, I thought to myself. On the other, I know that anyone back home would kill to have the kind of scholarship I received to study here. What do I do? Bewilderment. As a young adult male, I was navigating the territories of intimacy, dating, and relationships while confronting prescribed scripts of masculinity. On one hand, the guys who don't give a damn about these issues seem to find partners more easily than I do. On the other hand, in my childhood, I witnessed the physical and psychological harm that results from such scripts, and I don't want to continue that. What do I do? Bewilderment. How do I continue to share the truth of my education experiences abroad with my family and friends back home and communicate my love for them, even when I'm called a brainwashed, westernized intellectual? How do you write yourself into a history out of which you've been erased? I asked myself, while engaging narratives of imperialism through a comparative literature course in college called Masterpieces of Literature from Africa. I was confronting the legacy of formal education and its erasure of indigenous ways of knowing on the African continent. What does it mean for me to be a product of this education? This is what bewilderment looks like, being trapped in between opposing realities. To be clear, I did not find answers by spending time in the woods. What I found in the forest was a space in which I could belong to my own life's contradictions, paradox, in a more generous way without silencing myself or going crazy. In my sophomore year, an undergraduate dean introduced me to the work of author, philosopher, and educator Parker Palmer, who is also a Quaker elder. And his work has been instructive for me since then. In his book, Healing the Heart of Democracy, Dr. Palmer notes that when we hold paradox, the heart breaks. And when it does, it breaks in two ways. It can break into, piece, it can break into pieces that increase heart, and violence in the world, or it can break open to hold a larger reality. By the tree stump that became my spirit spot in the middle of that forest in Canada, I was learning how to relate to wilderness, how to befriend the woods in which I was once scared to wander. In doing so, I began to learn how to relate with the wildness of my own inner life to listen to the scary questions bubbling up from my conversations with Valerie, questions that were making my world a little more complicated than was comfortable for me. I still do not know to this day what it was that allowed me to ask these questions. Grace has something to do with it, and also the kind of learning community I've been a part of since then. But I think what motivated me was that I was, for the first time, beginning to speak in a voice I recognized as my own. I do not know if I would have found this voice without a relationship with the wilderness, a relationship that began with wonder. Wonder allowed me a reality to grow into my voice, which I recognized through finding space for my questions. And this, for me, has been the true touchstone of an education that is worthwhile. Thank you.
The world does not fit me. We root in where we have our first memories. Anyone can love the mountains. It takes a soul to love the prairies. The prairies have been torn apart. We don't know where we are from. Turkey Creek, we are broken. We are cut off. Death by suicide. Nature, where equality and justice happen. We can fight for our public lands. I am your veteran. Pain and hurt, wilder, plain in the mud, looking up at the stars, we return. Sylvan synthesia. 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 synesthesia, myth, memory, and metaphor, nature and culture, cloth woven by mist, the beat of the monsoon, forest set on fire, colonialism silenced the drumbeat of fire, steam engines, feeding the empire's growth, working grids, root, stem, leaves, resource. Fragrance of jasmine, leopard, iris met iris, beauty, gunshot, something breaks in the world. The fragility of beauty, different races plotted, the tourist's gaze, sacred forests enshrining the spirit, songs, stories, dance, art, and ritual, reciprocity, dynamic ecology, ecological memory. Rain that makes elephants shiver, entering the trance, trade as transformation, taking up the ritual, honey. Letting language take root. I left my hometown in Uganda, unprepared, no room for being unprepared. Innocent, I felt threatened, uncharted territory, a white piece of paper, sustainability. Rupture, rapture, harm, beliefs, piercing my heart, grace becomes evident when the human will falters. I sought solace in a forest, Douglas firs, deer, black bear, tree stump, spirit spot, retreat. Use your senses. Could it be true? I reject your hell and will love people out of it. I was falling. This is what bewilderment feels like. The Douglas fir held me. I never looked back. I saw the forest on the hill where I could belong to the questions. Bewilderment. How do you write yourself into a history where you have been erased? The forest a place where I could be at peace within my paradoxes. The heart breaks in two ways, breaking into pieces, breaking open. The wilderness of my own inner life, wonder growing into my voice, wilderness, the space of my questions. Three storytellers, three ways of knowing. Taproot. Thank you so much for bearing witness to the truth of your lives in place. Let's have a conversation. Questions, comments, stories. My voice might be a little hoarse, I haven't had some water in a little bit here, but um, you're all incredibly inspiring. You know, I, uh, I've had a chance to know Stacy, and um, I wasn't quite sure what I was gonna hear tonight, and uh, I just have to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for your uh, kindness and your generosity to share in such an elegant way, to have it relate from a heart perspective. You know, a lot of times you can hear things and have it sound smart, 
but you guys all did a really nice job connecting within the heart, so thank you. And I have to say, I relate with all the stories, but your particular story with never looking back is something that I wrestled with big time. I was raised very staunch Irish Catholic, and it created division because I knew in my heart something was missing. I was like, this isn't love like we talk about, right? So was it head over heart or was it heart over head? And I was a heart person. And so I, uh, so I had to do the same thing and, and go find my solace and get my answers or my questions answered mostly through the woods and going into the forest and discovering the forest. And it's a part of my, what I do, do today for, for work. So um, I feel the pain, man. <laughs> it's hard because you feel like you're letting people down, but in your heart, you know it's right. So uh, kudos for the courage. And for your courage, too. I just want to respond really briefly to that. I've been spending a lot of time reading the first four Gospels, and I think, not to give you any sense of grandeur, but like your your, your story it was like an was I mean was an evolution of Christ, and I thought that was really beautiful. I think in any reading of the Gospel, um, in my understanding of the Gospel and, and studying of theology, I feel like you were that embodiment with that entire story. So that was really beautiful. So I think from that perspective, Big JC would have given you a high five. <laughs> um, I just think as, maybe not in the Divinity School, um, as an undergraduate though, looking at anything from a spiritual perspective is, um, just not normal, I guess you could say. A lot, a lot of the other students aren't religious and coming from a pretty heavily religious background, that was something super surprising to me. Um, so just hearing you guys tackle this issue from a more spirit, spiritual perspective is super, super interesting from my point of view, just because I think the issue is beyond science. I read something the other day, just like the science is here. Everything we need is here. We figured out solutions. There's a way to combat a lot of the problems going on. Um, I think it's more of a personal problem right now. And I think we need more of an attachment to nature. And I think that's just super interesting to finally see other people who agree with that because that's not something that's really talked about um, a lot in the undergraduate program. It's mostly just let's learn about these science classes. Let's learn about the economics behind it. Let's learn about the public policy behind it. But we don't ever talk about maybe the spiritual side to it and how these problems could be fixed through that. What, what's your name again? Rachel. Rachel, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. If I just quickly responding to um, your remarks, the um, I spoke about religion. I could speak about any institution, mm -hmm. and I think the when when it comes to these questions around planetary health, asking uh, what what conversations are we not having mm -hmm. in the spaces is something to pay attention to. Um, the, what conversation are, are we? What conversations are we not having? What is taboo in this space, and how? How, how might we walk that line between what we've considered taboo and how might we blend different worlds together? Thank you. Just, just to add to that, um, like I also want to add that I think science is incredibly spiritual. In fact, I, I think I encountered my spirituality first through science. I mean, if it is, it in some ways is trying to advance the work of awe and wonder. Um, and uh, and a lot of science in the way that it's practiced may not seem that way, but um, like what was once the domain of philosophy is now being answered, or these questions are now being answered by science through quantum physics. It's talking about free will, and in some ways, my imagination can't keep up with the with what science offers me. And so I, I wonder if if there's um, there's a danger in saying okay, now no more science and only spirituality, and whether it might not be um, more useful to say, let's not be dual anymore, um, and let's look at both worlds for what it gives us. And I think, I think the English language provides us the word religion, right? Religio, reattachment. And so I think that's what we're talking about, and, and what is that? And I think um, ritual gets a, it's funny when, the global left 
love big, broad binaries, right? Because that's what it's all about. Um, <laughs> clearly. The, 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 but I mean, I think it's, it's interesting how we oftentimes mock or feel like we're mocking religion or spirituality. And then when we talk about nature, we want to talk about reattaching to it. And we talk about the power of ritual. Um, or even, I think, um, your um, presentation about forest. I, I can think of a lot of people who work in the timber industry that would be happy to hear that and, and the engagement with that, right? And so I think even what you said challenges traditional or historic notions of um, traditional or historic notions of um, environmentalism in this country and what that looks like. So, uh, and even with the science, right, and religion. I mean, the, if you start looking out of the cell and you go up into the universe, it expands into nothingness, right? And if you look down into a cell and keep going all the way in, it expands into nothingness. So how do we fill that space? Um, <clears throat> first of all, thank you, all, all three of you, and, and Terry, thank you. Um, and I, I feel a bit like stumbling into this question. Um, I've been listening to Tim Snyder, um, who's a, a historian from Yale who's talking about fascism. And it, I, he's quite brilliant. And one of the things he's noticing about fascism is that in fascism there's no future, um, which is a deeply profound notion to me, that, that there's, if you give up the notion of future, then a lot of things become possible. So not only do you challenge the notion of truth, but you notice that you challenge the notion of future itself. Um, and I think this generation is the first that can, that is confronting the possibility of no future, um, that the planet itself is being destroyed. Um, and I think we're having trouble getting our minds around that. Um, and the question I think I'd like to ask you then is, is how, how each of you or any one of you feels your spiritual life helps or doesn't help you have a sense of the future. Um, because I think my spiritual life helps me to see a greater context. Um, and I'm, I, I have a lot of despair about that, a lot of sadness about this really may be the way we end the world. And something else will happen in some other context. Um, but the science is that we're really destroying the planet. And, and it's not being turned around. So how, how do you see a future when, when that's the science? I can, I can take that. Um, first of all, I, I think um, any kind of spirituality, whether you come to it from science or religion, um, the very first thing you encounter is your own sense of scale in relation to everything else. And so, um, it would be presumptuous, I think, with a spiritual perspective, to think that we um, will destroy the earth. Um, we're just one small, small part of this just very, very complex, magnificent system. Um, and uh, so, so, so to that extent, I, I don't fear, I, I, I don't believe that we have that kind of power to stop time itself. You know, and in some way, that's very, very powerful to know that that the planet has its own, it's embedded with its own restorative kind of capabilities, and um, and I and I think that that kind of recognition of your own scale in response to everything else is at the same time as deliberating as it is powerful because it means that you can reverse the the trend. And so for me, um, I, the, the thought of not having a future is not alarming at all because I don't recognize, because we only talk about not having a, human, a future for the human. And I don't recognize, I mean, I hope not to recognize the human as really that separate in a sense. And so if the earth continues, that's wonderful. Parker Palmer talks about the politics of the brokenhearted, and um, I like to call my 
spirituality, the spirituality of the brokenhearted. Um, there is, I, I, feel a true, I feel a true sense of, um, there are moments that occur to me where I ask myself whether um, our, our species will make it, whether we'll, whether we'll make it to whatever is on the other side. Um, and in my own work, particularly with, um, with youth in education environments, both in school or outside of school, the, there is uh, the, hearing young people's stories and being present to their own moments of joy and their own moments of brokenness um, with, and since our programs are actually happening you know, in the middle of a forest, for example, in the Pacific Northwest, there is a true connection that I see in their brokenness and in the brokenness in the world. And they have more, there have been multiple experiences of despair um, in that for me. And part of what has happened for me spending time out in the woods whether I'm singing a song out or whether I'm walking through, I, I, was, wa I was walking um, in, the, in the waters of the Salish Sea in the Pacific Northwest um, a few years ago, and there was just this, this, it was a real place of trauma for me around um, family and gender issues, and I was walking through with a, a sense of numbness, and I was feeling the water just come to my feet and just paying attention to what was going on for me as I treaded the water. And all of a sudden, I got to a point where I just looked towards the, towards, towards the depth of the water. There were boats passing by. And I just burst out into a song I do not know the meaning of. But the word, there was just one word, which was baila. Right? And, and in, in Spanish, that's the word for dance. right? But I did not know that then. But I was just singing this song, baila. But there was a certain vitality that came for me in that moment just by paying attention to how I was connecting with the elements. And um, there was a real, I very much felt like this warrior who was like, okay, this is something I've been fearing to face, but I'm going to face it. And I don't think I would have been able to do that without having that connection um, to the land. And so I think, I, I don't think there are easy answers. Um, I, a part of me doubts whether we'll make it on the other side. But another part of me is rooted in joy and gratitude and protecting beauty that, um, that is present. And in those moments, I get a sense, I, I begin to celebrate what could be possible. I begin to believe in what could be possible. And I've drawn a lot from the work of Joanna Macy in that process as well. Um, so I had an experience this last year with my little girl and um, she it was after it was bath time right she got out of the bath she slipped through our hands she's naked she's excited and she's running from her parents she's having the time of her life right pure stoke right just little naked slippery baby running around <laughs> and her mom and I are frustrated and angry and we just would like to get her to bed so we could have 30 seconds to talk to each other before we fall asleep. And she's looking for the cat and she sprints around the table just missing her head from the table because she's this ginormous child, right? Sprints around, she knows the cat's on this little deck that we have, runs out of the deck and sees the sunset and stops short, right? <gasps> <gasps> She sees the sunset. She's so amazed. And it's this awe-inspiring moment. And her mom and I, like, back up right on her, right? Because I'm, I'm charging, and I don't stop very well. And I'm like, ah, you know, I don't. But I get caught by the awe, and her mom smashes into me, and I hop over her. And we have this moment of awe. And in that moment of kind of, like, trying not to boot my child off the deck, I have this moment of stoke, right? And all of a sudden, this horrible event a naked baby running free is, is done, right? <laughs> and we have in that, and then we put her to bed and she's happy and we collapse into bed and um, right before we turn on the British Baking Show, <laughs> which is like this generation's Bob Ross. Um, <laughs> this pure joy, right? It's pure joy and exhaustion. And the next morning, I think about that experience. 
and I think about my experience at war, and I think about what it is to be a father in Syria, and I think about a father and a mother sitting down, finally able to watch their child in a broken, bombed out apartment building in Aleppo. And the bomb explodes and the kid jumps out and runs seeking for shelter and is stopped in its tracks, in her tracks, by an explosion that she's never seen before. And she's awed in the most horrific way. And the same physical, chemical, actions are happening in the body that my daughter had from stoke to awe and ultimately collapses in the basement of the building asleep with exhaustion and fear and despair. And those same emotions are held and those same feelings are held in absolute reverse of one another. So what do you do with that? How do you live in such a way as to allow yourself joy but also to allow yourself deep pain and hurt. And I think if, you know, and I think part of it is not to seek the answer, right? And, and I, I've been guilty of that. You'll get healthier in the outdoors. You may not, right? But you have to hold the space, I think, for those questions. And I think figuring out how to root into, the, as has been said, the joy and the gratitude and the beauty and try and find ways to be odd positively. But, I mean, I think it's also a beautiful thought, the restorative power of the earth. Maybe what we're experiencing right now is the earth saying, figure it out, otherwise I will. And we're going to have to mourn. We're going to have to mourn. And we're going to have to mourn people. And we're going to have to... Cities will be gone and people will be gone, but we can create new cities. We have a potentially a beautiful opportunity to look more towards Abel and less towards Cain in this future. And I think that's, but yeah, I mean, I, I've never made the necessary connection between erasing the future, but as I think about some of the slogans at work, it's all backwards facing. So how do we help other people experience into that? How do we help other people I think there's a lot of people out there who feel like they're being made fun of all the time. And how do, how do we help them to see that we're not, that we're not teasing religion or spirituality, that that has a role too. Thank you. Thank you for holding this space. Thank you to each one of you. Andrew, Fatima, Stacy, um, this blessed community. And may we hold the questions um, as we begin to draw new maps together. Thank you so much for coming to the Constellation Project.